welcome everybody to our first in-house meeting. Who would have thought that uh, approximately 32 months ago in February of 2020, I guess it was, that uh, we'd be away for a while, but we're back and uh, thank you and welcome to everybody that's uh, tuning in on uh, Zoom. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have a presentation for dental care. Obviously, dental care is important to everybody in life, but it's really important to multiple myeloma patients as you begin your cancer treatment, uh, such as chemo, um, uh, stem cell transplants, and what to do after. Um, so today, we have Dr. Aaron Watson, and Dr. Watson is an assistant professor at University of Toronto's Faculty of Dentistry, as well as a general dentist at Princess Margaret Cancer Centre, where she holds the appointment as a clinician, investigator, and acts as the deputy chief of dentistry. Dr. Watson graduated with the gold medal from the Faculty of Dentistry at McGill University in 2012, followed by a residency in hospital-based uh, dentistry at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, as well as a master's in health administration at the University of Toronto. And Dr. Watson is a published author in peer-reviewed journals with a special interest in dental care for patients with hematologic malignancies and head and neck cancer, as well as the inequity experienced by cancer patients seeking dental care. She's been the co-chair of the International Society of Oral Oncology Study Group for the past two years and has previously sat on the executive board of the Canadian Association of Hospital Dentists and newly appointed member of the Ontario Dental Association Hospital Committee, the president of the board of directors of Kensington Kids Early Learning Centre and the co-chair of the Cancer Care Ontario Working Group Dentistry Service for Oncology Patients. I have no idea what you do in your spare time. So without further ado, th we uh, thank her obviously for sharing some of her free time on Saturday and please uh, give her a warm welcome as uh, our speaker today and our first speaker since COVID. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for having me here today. Very, very pleased to come and speak to a group of patients. Um, I think that the Myeloma Toronto group does a fantastic job of, um, I guess, recruiting members because I actually had three patients come up to me this week and let me know that they were going to be attending virtually. So I think that you have a very wide audience, which is fantastic. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about dental care for patients diagnosed with myeloma. If you have questions, um, I think those of you who are on Zoom are going to be able to ent enter questions into the chat and then we'll answer them at the end of the session. But for anyone who's here live in the audience, if you wanna ask a question as I'm going through the presentation, feel free to interrupt me. Usually if you're thinking of a question, other people have the question too, so it's helpful to answer it. Um, before I forget, because I think it's an important thing to mention, and I don't think I have it anywhere in my slides, um, I would just like to point out that we've noticed in the department that many patients with myeloma have been really, really hesitant to go see the dentist during COVID, which is normal because many patients are immunosuppressed. Some patients have had transplants and haven't been able to get vaccinated yet and feel concerned about going out into the public. I would reassure you that really good studies have been done about COVID and dentistry. We didn't see any increased transmission in dental offices. Dentists didn't catch COVID more often than anyone else, despite the fact that we were performing aerosol generating procedures. Um, and I think the fact that we decided to close dental offices for a period of time kind of gave everyone the false sense that dentistry is a little bit more dangerous than it really is. So if you've been hesitant to get back to the dentist and have kind of been holding off because um, you're, you're quite worried, if you're unvaccinated, I think that's pretty reasonable. But for the most part, if you have the opportunity to get back into the dentist chair, I would encourage you to. Um, so just one small conflict. This was many years ago, but I like to declare any conflict that I've had. I have previously been paid by Amgen Pharmaceuticals, which is the company that produces Exgiva, which is sometimes prescribed to patients with myeloma as opposed to an intravenous bisphosphonate um, like zoledronic acid, also known as Zomata um, or Primogenate. So I have previously spoken to them about... Um, about, uh, about how they can prevent MRONG and complications from these medications in their patients. Um, so already got a pretty good introduction, um, but just to know that we do treat a ton of patients with multiple myeloma at our center. Over the past five years, I've seen approximately 350 new patients with myeloma. Um, this is a picture of my two kids. This is what I do in my spare time, um, is be a mom. 
Uh, my son is two years old, but he's pretty massive. My daughter's six um, and missing most of her front teeth. And we went to Longo's and they have, an, uh, you know, like one of the actual two little cars that they can drive while they're in the cart. So they think Longo's is just the most awesome <laughs> grocery store. There, and they always ask if we can go back to the race car grocery store. Um, so another thing that I do um, is I do try and advocate a lot for expanded dental services for cancer patients. Um, so some of you may have been in a position where you've been told, you know, you're not supposed to be having your teeth extracted because you've been on intravenous bisphosphonates in the past. But then if you end up with a problem with one of your teeth, the only thing that OHIP is going to pay for is for us to remove the tooth. They won't actually, they're paying for a treatment that isn't even recommended. Um, so one of the things that I do very much is try to speak to government and talk to them about trying to expand the scope of services that are available to really specific groups of patients seeking dentistry as part of their cancer treatment. And that's what I'm doing right now with Cancer Care Ontario. Um, we have a working group made up in the province and we're really actively looking to address infrastructure issues. So having access to dentistry at certain hospitals that don't currently have dental services, but making sure that the funding that's available through OHIP is a little bit more expensive than what we have right now. So hopefully in the coming years we'll see some expansion of services. Um, I also find that there's often not a lot of dentists who understand how to treat patients who are going through cancer treatment. Um, so we started a fellowship at Princess Margaret where we train two dentists every year to kind of do the type of dentistry that we do. And I've also started a course called Dental Management of Cancer and Transplant Patients at University of Toronto. So now dental students receive this education as well. So oral health can play a really big role in your cancer journey. Uh, as many patients know, if you're being planned for a stem cell transplant, you're going to be sent to a dentist to make sure that you ha don't have any dental infections. Um, if you're a patient who's been started on intravenous bisphosphonates, you're going to want to see a dentist before you start on those medications to make sure that you don't have any infected or hopeless teeth. Um, so, so sometimes, depending on what treatment you're going through, you can require really specific care. And in general, patients often ask me kind of, you know, if I'm about to start treatment, what are the important things for me to do? So before you start your treatment, is there a laser pointer on this? I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I almost wanna try and press in and see if, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, before we start our treatment, you want to get a nice overall checkup. And sometimes when you've been seeing a dentist for a while, they'll go in, you'll do your cleaning, they'll come and take a look at your teeth, and they take a really specific type of x-ray that's checking for cavities in between your teeth, but not necessarily looking for infections or other forms of disease. So asking for kind of an overall checkup can be quite important. I usually encourage patients to get a cleaning too. Um, depending on what type of treatment you're going through, treatment can last for different periods of time, but a really nice way to start everything off is with nice clean teeth. Um, and then, of course, treating any teeth with infections and cavities if they're time. But if you had to pick a priority, you'd be more focused on eliminating infections than worrying so much about cavities. Once you're in treatment, it's really important that your dentist be checking your blood work before you go in for any type of dental procedure. And there's two things that we really look at in particular, your platelet count, which is what you need to stop bleeding, and your neutrophil count, which is what you need to make sure you don't end up with infections in the mouth. And for some patients, we may be limited to only emergency care, and patients should do their best to keep their mouth clean. And I'll get into this in a little bit more detail after. After treatment, we highly recommend regular, uh, regular checkups and making sure that you're taking x-rays and catching problems when they're still small and easy to fix. A lot of times when patients have been through a lot of treatment, had a number of CT scans, they feel a little bit worried about adding extra radiation because they've already had a lot of radiation. A dental x-ray is much, 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 much less strong than say, for example, a CT scan. It's gonna be like 10,000 times less strong. So you don't have to be too concerned about taking dental x-rays. So as I was saying, a usual patient, when, you're seeing a, pa uh, when a dentist is seeing a patient, um, well, the first time we ever see a patient, we usually take an x-ray that actually shows us the patient's entire jaw. And we take a bunch of x-rays of any teeth, well, you know, that have big fillings or root canals or craps on them, and we're able to detect infections. Once you're already into a dental practice and are going every six months and getting your routine checkups and cleanings, you don't get a fulsome assessment like that very often. In theory, we're supposed to repeat that every five years, but in practice that doesn't often happen. So that would be an important thing to think about if you're being, um, if you've just been diagnosed, if you're about to start some form of treatment, is asking your dentist to take more than just the x-rays to check for cavities. 
Um, the x-ray that I'm talking about specifically is called a panoramic x-ray and later in the presentation I'll show you what that looks like. Um, but you want to make sure that you're going to treat any actively infected teeth. And when your dentist is just taking x-rays that check for cavities, they can't detect infections like that. So that's very important. And then you obviously want to think about the duration of treatment. When I say that it's, you know, um, you want to limit tr uh, care when you're under treatment, treatment can mean a lot of different things. So you want to think about the amount of time that you're going to be under treatment. So I, you know, I would think differently someone who's been newly diagnosed and is say going through a bit more intensive Cybor D type of chemotherapy for four months with the goal to get into remission so that you can proceed towards a stem cell transplant versus a patient who's had a stem cell transplant is considered to be relatively in remission and is on say Revlimid. Um, patients are going to be on Revlimid for many, many years and it wouldn't be reasonable to avoid dental care because you're on that medication. Well, now it doesn't want to let us click. So what would you expect if you went to go see your dentist for an exam? It would be very, very common for your dentist to not know very much about your diagnosis. At Princess Margaret, we do lots of stem cell transplants, so we see lots of patients with myeloma, but actually myeloma is a fairly rare disease, so it would be uncommon for your dentist to know very much about myeloma, and that doesn't mean that they're a bad dentist or that you shouldn't trust them. Um, it actually just means that you may have to educate them a little bit, and one of the things that I most commonly find that patients need to educate their dentists about is um, about bisphosphonates, about IV bisphosphonates. Um, so that's one thing that you may have to to tell your dentist about. Whenever I teach dentists about treating patients with myeloma, I tell them that it's not enough to just ask for a list of medications from the pharmacy because drugs that you receive in the hospital don't go on that list. So that's an important thing to make sure you let your dentist know. Um, another thing that I encourage patients to do is to bring their blood work to their appointments so that they can show their dentist and kind of train your dentist to get into the habit of checking your blood work. And most patients will have access to their blood work on a form of patient portal, so something that you can access online. If for some reason you're not super technologically savvy, you don't like accessing your blood work online, when you go in to have your blood work taken, you can ask to take a copy of your results away with you. Sometimes whoever you're talking to will give you a little bit of pushback and say, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. And you can say, no, that's mine. That's my medical record. I'm allowed to take that with me. Um, you may also have to advocate to your dentist a little bit about taking x-rays. Just like I told you not to be concerned about x-rays, sometimes dentists don't realize that. And they may say something to you like, ooh, you've had a, you know, I worked for a dentist once. Um, who saw a patient from Princess Margaret and they had had a CT scan the day before, so he decided not to take x-rays the next day because they just had a CT scan. And I, th you know, I said, what, what is that? You just made that up on the spot. That was just a feeling that you had. Um, so yeah, don't, you may need to advocate a little bit to your dentist about taking x-rays. Um, and just in general, access to treatment. It's very common, unfortunately, for us to see that we send patients to go back out to see their dentist after they finish with us at Princess Margaret, that sometimes they need a little bit of reluctance because the dentist will say something like, ooh, I don't know if this is okay, I don't know if this is safe. So a lot of time we'll send patients back to their dentist with a letter explaining the blood count values that are important to check, which medications are concerning, and that sort of thing. During treatment. So chemotherapy, like I said, can mean a lot of different things. There's strong forms of chemotherapy, there's less strong forms of chemotherapy. Um, often when patients are going through Cyborg D, they may experience some side effects from their, from their chemotherapy, because that's a little bit of stronger chemotherapy. And then if you're going to be receiving a stem cell transplant, that's very strong chemotherapy. And that's when you're really going to notice the most mouth side effects. After treatment, some patients are placed on drugs like Ninlaro or Revlimid. Those typically don't have so much of an effect on the mouth, but they do impact your blood count. So it's very common for me to say, pa see patients, for example, on Revlimid who have persistently low neutrophil counts and persistently low platelet counts, but not so low that it becomes unsafe to perform dentistry. It's just important to keep an eye on it. Um, so that's why it's important that we be routinely checking blood work. So I'm going to get a little bit more into these different side effects that you can sometime experience. So sometimes when patients are going through chemotherapy, especially strong chemotherapy, they can experience tooth sensitivity. And this is something that we very commonly see in patients. Teeth can ex become quite sensitive, in particular to cold. 
one of the ways that is really effective to treat this is with sensodyne. Um, I put Colgate here so that you don't think that, you know, I have shares in Sensodyne or anything like that. I don't. But when you watch those commercials where they talk about how like 90% of dentists recommend, recommend Sensodyne, we really do because we really like it and it really works. Um, I love Sensodyne. This is what I use. They have a brand called Rapid Relief, which is super effective. So I often tell patients if your teeth are feeling really sensitive, you can actually take some of the toothpaste and just rub it onto the teeth that are feeling painful and leave it there. And that can be quite effective. Um, as dentists, we also have desensitizers in our clinic that we can apply to the teeth. Um, ultimately though, time will heal this. So this isn't something that needs to be treated unless it's bothering you. It's something that will go away with time. Mouth sores are also something that will go away on their own. So this is something that will get better with time. Mouth sores tend to happen when patients are going through chemotherapy because chemotherapy impacts cells that are um, what we say turning over really fast. So when you're getting new cells all the time, if you've ever cut yourself inside of your mouth, it takes like three to five days to heal inside of your mouth. And when you become a dentist, we get so used to things inside, of, inside the mouth healing so quickly that sometimes I'll cut myself and I'll be so confused as to why it's not healed already like five days later. So things inside the mouth heal really fast, but that also means that they're easily damaged by any type of medication that targets cells that are turning over quickly. So that can cause the inside lining of the mouth to become quite sore. Again, this is something that's going to go away on its own. It's caused by chemotherapy and it will go away when your intensive chemotherapy stops. While it's there, um, what you can do is use bland mouth rinses to keep the mouth nice and clean. We usually recommend warm water with a teaspoon of baking soda. Ice chips can be really, really helpful. Um, the fancy way to call it is cryotherapy, but really it's just ice chips. Um, and sometimes numbing agents can be prescribed as well, especially if patients are having difficulty with eating or with uh, maintaining oral hygiene. In very, very rare cases, some patients have to take a break from treatment because of mouth sores, but that happens very infrequently. And one of the reasons that I like recommending a cleaning before patients start treatment is because, unless someone comes to me with a super clean mouth, which often happens too, um, but we know that these mouth sores happen less frequently in patients when their mouths are very, very clean. Sometimes you can also develop a type of mouth sore called a neutropenic ulcer, which is basically a type of sore that develops in the mouth when your neutrophils are quite low. And those are important to prevent from getting infected and sometimes we'll prescribe prescription mouth rinses to prevent them from becoming infected. This is a patient who's experiencing mouth sores or what we call mucositis related to their, uh, their chemotherapy. And as their chemotherapy stops, that will go away. Um, if you develop a mouth infection, that's something that does require medical attention. So sometimes when patients are going through treatment, our mouths are full of different bacteria, viruses, and fungi, and they all kind of are supposed to live together happily. If you're placed on certain medications, sometimes that can push your mouth towards one of those species taking over. Patients are often placed on antiviral medications and antibiotic medications, and sometimes they'll develop fungal infections in the mouth because what's happened is all these different medications have pushed the mouth more towards fungal infections. So this is called thrush. It's something that also occurs fairly commonly in babies. Um, it's easy to treat. We prescribe an antifungal medication um, and that will get better quite quickly. Another thing that we sometimes see is that patients who have, say, a herpes virus that is lying dormant, it can come, become reactivated and patients can develop mouth, uh, cold sores. Um, and most patients, if this is happening frequently, will be placed on antiviral medications to prevent this from happening. And then lastly, um, we worry about dental infections too. Uh, so obviously, we don't want patients to develop dental infections as they're going through treatment. The dental infection untreated can become quite serious. So if you develop a dental infection, it's important to see your dentist and have it treated. This is an example of a neutropenic ulcer. So this is a patient who just barely traumatized the side of their tongue. And normally, neutrophils would come in and kind of heal that up for you. And when you don't have a lot of neutrophils, that healing process just doesn't happen. And that's why we would want to prevent this from getting infected. If you had a mouth infection um, or you think that maybe you have a mouth infection or you're not really sure, a good rule of thumb is if it hasn't gone away in two weeks, it's important for a dentist to check it, especially if it's a sore in your mouth. 
A really, really important thing to pay attention to is dry mouth. I have several patients with myeloma in my practice at Princess Margaret who have a severe dry mouth because of all the medications that they are on. And when you have a very, very dry mouth, your teeth actually can't really live in a dry environment. So teeth are basically a crystal that's held in place with calcium, and that's your tooth. In a dry mouth, your mouth loses this nice ability of saliva to keep the mouth nice and neutral. Saliva is very similar to water. Without saliva, the mouth becomes much more acidic, so a little bit more like Coca-Cola or lemon juice. And if you take that calcium crystal and put it in an acid environment, the calcium starts coming out and the crystal structure of the tooth starts to dissolve. The technical name for that is a dry mouth cavity, but it's not really a dry mouth, it's not really a cavity, because it's not so much caused by not brushing or eating too much sugar, it's just that the tooth can't physically survive in this new dry acidic environment. So we prevent that from happening by using fluoride. Fluoride replaces the calcium that's come out of the tooth and makes a new form of tooth that's called a, a fluorapatite crystal. And your fluorapatite crystal can actually hang out in a dry environment, no problem. So when we see patients starting to develop dry mouth cavities, we often will put them on fluoride. Sometimes that can just be a more high fluoride content toothpaste. So if you go to Shoppers Drug Mart, they have a type of toothpaste called Prevenant 5000. It's a high fluoride toothpaste that you can use once or twice a day. And that can be a really, really effective way of preventing dry mouth cavities. Sometimes when patients have a really, really dry mouth or developing tons of cavities, we actually make special trays that allow them to put fluoride onto their teeth every night to prevent these types of cavities from happening. So if you're seeing your dentist and you find that you're constantly getting new cavities around your fillings, especially if it's root cavities, that's a sign that you're developing dry mouth cavities. And no matter how good of a dentist you have, if you don't treat the dry mouth and if you don't use fluoride, all the dentistry that they're going to do isn't going to work and it's going to develop new cavities unless we do something about changing the actual structure of the tooth. So that's a really important thing and that's something that we commonly see. When a patient has dry mouth, they're also at increased risk of having gum disease. So it is important to get regular cleanings and to provide really, really good home care. When I say really good home care, I'm really just talking about brushing twice a day, but also cleaning between the teeth. And especially as you get older, the spaces between your teeth get a little bit wider. Floss is really, really good for people who have really small spaces between their teeth because floss is really tiny. As you start getting a bit of gum disease and the bone starts lowering down around the teeth and you start getting a little longer in the tooth, those spaces are much wider between the teeth. So you need something bigger to get them out. A product that I absolutely love is called a water flosser or a water pick, um, also available at shoppers. I also don't have any steaks and shoppers either. Um, probably at Costco too. But it does an absolutely magnificent job of keeping teeth clean and preventing gum disease from getting worse. Um, I would say that not about 95% of the time now when I see a patient and say, man, your gums look fantastic, they'll tell me I use a water flosser. Um, if you develop a dry mouth, when should you be concerned? I would be worried if it lasts for more than three months. So up to three months, we're not gonna see much damage to the teeth. If it's lasting for more than three months, we start worrying about damage to the teeth. And how do you know if you have a dry mouth? It would be something like it wakes you up at night because your mouth is so dry. You would wake up in the morning and have a feeling like your cheeks are stuck to the sides of your teeth. Um, you would have a lot of difficulty speaking for this long without drinking water. Um, so those would be the types of things that you would uh, pick up on if you had a very dry mouth. This is what dry mouth cavities look like. They tend to spread along the, um, the top level of the teeth. So if you grind your teeth a little bit, your tooth basically has a couple different layers, but there's a hard outer layer called enamel, which is the white stuff that we see. And then there's a soft inner layer called dentin. And anywhere we wear through our enamel, like if we grind a little bit, those are the places that will develop cavities or along the gum line where the root is exposed. Um, these were some of the options that I was talking about for patients who are interested in having more fluoride in their oral hygiene regimen. Prevenant 5000 is this high fluoride toothpaste, but any high fluoride toothpaste around 1%
would be fine. It doesn't have to be Prevident, and that's something available over the counter that you can buy in any pharmacy. Um, and then fluoride rinse. I find Opti Rinse from Expert is quite, uh, quite good. They have one for daily use and one for weekly use. I think one's mint and one's grape. I can't remember which is which, but often patients prefer the grape version because they sometimes find that the mint version is a little bit stingy in the mouth. Um, and then there's what I was talking about, these fluoride trays that your dentist can actually make for you. And what we do is we take imprints of the top and bottom teeth and we make this special tray that allows patients to put fluoride gel in every night. They put it onto the teeth and this does a marvelous job of preventing cavities from happening. Um, this is called a hairy tongue, which sometimes can also happen if you have dry mouth. It's basically just little extra bits of protein that are growing on the roof of the tongue and they can be scraped off. It's not fresh. Sometimes you'll see your family doctor and they might tell you that you have fresh, but if it looks like little hairs, it's just something that needs to be scraped off with a tongue scraper. Products to help with dry mouth are really to make you feel better, but they're not going to prevent your risk of getting cavities. So Bio Extra is a company uh, that makes really, really awesome products for dry mouth. Um, according to the Bio Extra rep, so take it with a grain of salt, um, Biotein used to have all these same ingredients and then they got bought out by a big pharmaceutical company and they changed their ingredients and many patients tell me that they're not nearly as effective as they used to be. Bio Extra um, apparently has the same formulas of what Biotein used to be. So our patients really like Bio Extra. In particular, there's a gel that they sell, which is this one right here, um, that we get a lot of really positive feedback about. Oral Science is a company that makes um, a bunch of different dry mouth products, but one of them is Xylomelts. So that's another one that patients tell me they really like. It's something that you can stick on the inside of your cheek at night. So if you experience a lot of dryness at night and find that really frustrating, that's something that can help. But important to remember that this is for improving quality of life. It won't actually improve any of the side effects of dry mouth like gum disease or risk of cavities. Um, so I think I touched upon this fairly well already, but basically when a dentist is asking for your blood counts, we're looking at your white blood cells, specifically your neutrophils, we're looking at your hemoglobin, and we're looking at your platelets, which is what you need for clotting blood. Every institution is different, but most institutions, if you have a PIC line or a Hickman line, as you're going through treatment, will want you to have antibiotics before any invasive form of dental procedure, because in theory, bacteria from the mouth could get into the bloodstream, travel to the line, and infect it. Um, when are blood counts worrisome? We typically start sending patients back out into the community as long as their platelet count is above about 60 or 70. When it starts to drop below 50, we start to get worried about bleeding, and when it drops below 30, we'll order a platelet transfusion for a patient. Um, sometimes, if your neutrophil count becomes low, your dentist may recommend that your, or sorry, not your dentist, but your oncologist may recommend that you stop brushing or flossing, and then when the neutrophil count comes back up, they'll tell you that you're allowed to brush and floss again. Typically, when neutrophils drop below 1.0, we start to thinking about giving antibiotics for dental procedures, um, and a prescription mouth rinse, the same one that we use for preventing infections when patients have neutropenic ulcers, um, can be a really effective way to keep the mouth nice and fresh uh, if there's a period of time where you're not allowed to brush. After treatment, dentistry really depends. Um, depends on maintenance medications. Most patients are on maintenance medications and will need their blood work uh, regularly checked. Making sure to keep an eye out for dry mouth and addressing any of the concerns from dry mouth. Um, but most patients can get back to regular care. Um, so what dentistry is really specifically important to patients with myeloma? Many patients with multiple myeloma are placed on a medication called intravenous zomata or zoledronic acid, which is part of a group of medications called bisphosphonates. And basically what bisphosphonates do is they turn off a cell that eats bone. So in everyone's body, there's two types of cells. There's a bone eating cell and there's a bone making cell. And sometimes in myeloma, that bone eating cell starts to get out of control and starts making holes in the bones. And patients will have vertebral fractures or different fractures of different bones, which have a really significant impact on quality of life. So many patients are started on this drug, Zomata, which stops the bone eating cell from working. So only the bone making cell is working and that fills up all the holes in the bones and really improves quality of life. However, there are some times where you need that bone eating cell. And one of those times is when we pull out teeth. 
When we pull out teeth, you can imagine there's a fairly jagged shape of bone around the tooth. And it's actually that bone eating cell's job to come in and eat up all those little bits of bone so that everything will heal up nicely. So sometimes when we take out teeth in patients who have been on these drugs, things don't heal the way they're supposed to. And instead, patients can develop a condition called medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw. That is a very, very fancy way of saying death of jawbone because of a medication that I've been taking. Um, this happens more frequently when patients have been on the drug for longer. So we see it more frequently if a patient's been on the drug for, say, a year versus only a single dose. Risk seems to plateau when you've been on the medication for about two years. Most patients will be placed on this drug for about two years, once a month, and then maybe another two years every three months, and then usually it's stopped. And the reason it can be stopped is because it lives in the bones for many, many years. So if we, when we think about how long it lives in the jaws for, we estimate that it takes about 12 years before half of the zomata is gone from the bones in the jaws. So even if you stop taking this medication, the concern about having teeth removed or having surgeries in the mouth still exists because it lives in the jaw bones for a very, very long time before it's removed. So if you were going to be started on one of these medications, it's important to see a dentist and remove any teeth that you won't be likely to keep for the rest of your life. And it's also very important to focus on the rest of your life part. You know, if you're 80 years old and you have some back molars with a little bit of, you know, recession, there's been a little bit of bone loss around them, you've had those teeth for 68 years. It is highly unlikely that in the next 20 years, those teeth are gonna suddenly suffer from way greater disease than what's happened in the last 68 years. So it's important to think about how long the teeth actually need to stay for and to not be too aggressive, but also not to leave problems that need to be addressed. Sometimes, yes? In the last slide, uh, you mentioned a drug there called Exgiva. Yes. Does that have the same effects as Zomata or Imidrinate? So the question is um, that I mentioned a drug in my slide called Exgiva, also, it's a, uh, also known as Denosumab, and is it the same as Zomata or Pomidronate? Um, so they work slightly differently. The big difference is that Exgiva, in theory, only lives in the body for about six months before half of it is eliminated. So the risk of developing Emrange in a patient who's on Exgiva versus Zomata is almost equivalent, but if you were to develop the condition and we were to take you off of the medication, it would resolve slightly more frequently in the patient who is on Exgiva than in the patient who is on Zomata. Pomidronate is 67 times less potent than Zomata. So permidronate, we see this type, of, um, but this type of event happen less frequently. However, the reason more patients are on Zomata than permidronate is because Zomata does a better job of protecting your bones. And ultimately, that's the most important thing to focus on. The dental side effects are unfortunate, but keeping your bones healthy is the most important thing. And whatever drug your doctor thinks is going to do that would be the best drug to be on. So here's an example of a very mild case of what this can look like. Um, this is basically just a, a spot where the patient has a little opening in their gum and I can take my little dental measuring stick, it's called a, a perio pro, but it's really just a dental measuring stick and I can stick it right down to bone there. That tooth's fine, the patient's not in pain. Um, this is just a very early form of, of emrange that happens spontaneously, so it kind of happened on its own. This is also a case that happened on its own very common place to see this. This is a patient's lower molar, and this is the tongue side of the, um, of the gum around the lower molar. And what we often see here is kind of these spontaneous, so it just kind of happens on their own, maybe because of trauma, um, bone exposed in this part of the jaw. And again, not in pain, doesn't hurt them. They just have this little piece of bone exposed. Very, very severe cases. I'll show you those two just quickly. I don't want to make anyone nauseous. Um, <laughs> But these are more severe cases, and this happens very infrequently. I don't have any pictures from the last five years. These pictures are more than five years old, and that's really positive. We're just not seeing this as frequently now that there's a lot more understanding about these medications and what they do. So like I said, the important thing to know is that the risk of this happening becomes higher the longer you're on the medication for, and it doesn't, the risk doesn't go away once you stop the medication. But it is quite preventable. So how can we prevent it? 
by making you sure you see a dentist before you start on the medication. And, listen, and you know, if they recommend removing any teeth, take their advice, remove teeth that they feel very strongly you won't be able to keep. Um, again, just like a patient, dentist might not know a lot about your diagnosis of myeloma, your dentist may not understand very much about these drugs. Patients are very commonly placed on bisphosphonates for osteoporosis, so dentists see a huge number of people on pills, all the pill form of this type of medication, that is like a thousand to 10,000 times less strong than what you're receiving. So sometimes they'll be a bit confused and say, oh, I do take out teeth all the time for patients who are on bisphosphonates. But the bisphosphonates that they're used to are totally different than the bisphosphonates that a patient with myeloma would be prescribed that they get through an IV at the hospital once a month. So you may need to educate your dentist about that. And like I said, making sure we take that panoramic x-ray. So this is the type of x-ray that your dentist takes when you come in for cavities. Um, this is the top, bottom, right, and left. You can probably see there's a, you know, a big hole in the tooth here. So this is where someone's developed a cavity underneath a filling. But other than that, I'm not picking up on any huge concerns here. When I switch to the Panorex for this exact same patient, I'm a dentist, so obviously this is easy for me to read, but I start picking up on all sorts of other problems that make me want to take a bunch of close-up x-rays of these teeth. And when I take the close-up x-rays, I actually find a gigantic infection up here. This tooth has an infection. This tooth has bone loss all the way down to the tip of the root. So does this one here. And we never would have picked up on any of those things if we were just relying on the routine x-rays that are taken every time you go in for your checkups. So that's why I keep harping on like this different type of x-ray that needs to be taken. Um, how else can you prevent emrange? You can prevent emrange by changing the way you think about your teeth after you start on the medication. So once you started on the medication, there is what I call a relative contraindication to taking out teeth, which is a fancy way of saying you're not supposed to take out teeth unless you have a really good reason. Um, and a really good reason would be infection, pain that can't be controlled with a root canal treatment. Take good care of the teeth that you have. Like I said, water floss, water pick, fantastic way to keep the teeth nice and clean. Um, maybe go in for cleanings more frequently. A lot of insurance companies will cover cleanings every three to four months. That can be a really, really good way to keep your teeth in your mouth. Um, regular x-rays for early detection and using fluoride if you have a dry mouth to prevent cavities. Um, I already talked about that. Your dentist might not understand the strength of the medication you're taking, but they also have a lot of a, a very hard time accepting imperfect dentistry. So dentists are very type A. We like to fix things. We like to intervene. We're interventionalists. If a dentist sees a tooth that they can't fill properly, they want to pull it out and they want to put an implant. When you can't really pull out your teeth safely, sometimes an okay filling is much better than taking out a tooth and potentially causing a really significant healing issue. So what I mean by this is here's an example of a patient who had a tooth break off in the back of their mouth. There's very, very little tooth left here. This is the biting part of teeth that you normally have. This is a cap. That's why it shows up as bright white because it's all metal. This is filling material. But this is a tooth that's completely broken off of the gum line. And normally you would remove that tooth, but because the patient had been on Zometa for a couple of years and there was a risk that it wouldn't heal if we extracted the tooth, we instead send them for a root canal treatment and then the tooth stays kind of cut off at the gum line. So it's not infected, it's been root canal treated, it's not gonna hurt and it doesn't need to be removed. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to advocate to the government to have covered is when you've been given a medication because of your cancer treatment and you can't have the tooth pulled out, I think that that type of treatment should be covered. Just uh, to give you an example of what this can look like, here's a patient that I saw where same thing, we did root canals, take the tooth down to the gum level, put a filling in it, and then I can build a denture on top and you can still have a reasonable aesthetic outcome and still be able to chew and function. So what happens if you get emrange? Well, if you get emrange, um, that's medication related osteonecrosis of the jaw, about 20 to 30 percent of cases will get better. Most cases will kind of just wax and wane, so become infected, then we put a patient on antibiotic, then they feel better, and kind of go back and forth like that over time. 
If possible, if a patient develops MRONG, we try and stop the medication so that they don't get more doses of it. Stopping the medication, like I just told you, doesn't erase the medication that's already happened, but it at least prevents further doses from being administered. Um, another question I commonly get asked is what dental work is safe? So checkups are super safe. We want to catch problems when they're small and easy to fix. Cleanings are safe, fillings, x-rays, crowns, root canals. It's only stuff that involves bone. So pulling a tooth out of bone, putting an implant into bone, lifting gums off a of bone for gum surgery. Those are the only things you need to be concerned about if you've been on these bone strengthening drugs. Yes? So, yes, yeah, so the question is, it says cleaning other than surgical cleaning, what's a surgical cleaning? So once in a while, your dentist, usually a gum specialist, will recommend lifting the gums off the teeth and actually cleaning deep, 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 and then they put the gums back. You wouldn't want to do that. But I think that if your dentist explained the procedure to you and explained that they were going to be lifting your gums off, your t off the bone and off of your teeth, that should kind of just trigger a warning sign. This is starting to sound like surgery. I don't think that I can do that. That's a good question. Um, so I talked a little bit about the medications that some patients are placed on to keep them in remission. It can some pact sometimes impact your blood counts. So making sure that you're showing your blood work to your dentist and making it sure it's safe for you to receive dentistry. Um, a few kind of different things to end off with that you may experience if you're a patient diagnosed with myeloma. Um, sometimes myeloma can appear in the gums and it can look almost like a gum swelling or an abscess. If that were to happen, your dentist would end up referring you to a specialist and they would take a little piece of it and determine that it was myeloma um, and they would need to change their treatment. So this is a patient who was sent back to see me by their dentist because they thought that they had a gum abscess and I thought that looked a little strange for a gum abscess so I just took a little piece of it and it came back as a plasma cytoma which is a focus of myeloma in the jaw. Patient just went back onto medication and that went away on its own. It didn't require any actual treatment in the mouth. It just went away with chemotherapy. What other things can happen? Sometimes patients diagnosed with uh, myeloma will also have amyloid deposits. And one of the places that amyloid, it's just a uh, protein, can accumulate is in the tongue. So sometimes we'll see patients whose tongues are enlarged because of amyloid, and you can actually kind of see the indents of the teeth along the outside of the tongue because the tongue is bigger than the mouth intended. And that is also something that can wax and wane with treatment. So with myeloma treatment, the amyloid will become more controlled and the tongue will be smaller. If the myeloma is being less well controlled, the tongue may get bigger again. Sometimes myeloma can look like holes in the jaws when we take x-rays. Um, your dentist might see this and they might feel worried or surprised. So this is an example of a fairly normal looking x-ray, just to kind of give you an idea of what normal is supposed to look like. And then here's bone with myeloma, where you can probably appreciate that there's a kind of looks like there's a lot of holes in the bone. And what we're seeing here is just the myeloma in the jaws. And that doesn't put the patient at increased risk of their jaw breaking or anything like that. It's just an incidental finding that we might find on your x-ray. Um, this is much more pronounced, so you can kind of see that it looks like there's very, very large holes in the bones here. And when patients are placed on Zomeda to make the bones stronger, you can actually see how the bone got stronger there. So you see the difference, like especially if you look here, how there's, it's very dark, which is a sign that there's not a lot of structure there. And then here it becomes bright white because the bone has become much, much thicker because of these drugs. But you can also imagine how if I were going to go and take out that tooth, I have all this like really thick bone there that's been impacted by the drug, so I'd feel concerned about taking that out. Um, last thing I'm going to touch upon is these new dental funding programs that are out. Bob asked me to speak about that because I guess that some people have questions about them. So one thing that's currently available right now in Ontario is the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Plan. The Ontario Seniors Dental Care Plan is really based off of your income levels. So depending on how much income you have, either as a single person or someone living with a partner, um, if you're below these levels, you're eligible to be uh, part of the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Plan. It's really, really easy to apply. There's an online application form. The problem with this dental plan is that in all of their wisdom, 
our government decided that it had to be delivered at public health units. So even though there is enough dentists, probably more dentists than we need in Ontario, all able to provide care, they decided that only dentists that they've hired and put on salaries in these public health units can deliver this form of care. So unfortunately, from what I understand, the waits right now for treatment are exceptionally long. So a patient might get seen for an exam and get booked back for their filling like six months later. So patients are having a lot of difficulty accessing this care, but it is available. Um, there's also this new federal dental program that we're talking about. Um, so far, it's only being rolled out um, for kids under 12 years old, but it does seem like in the future it's going to continue expanding to other age groups, and this care can be provided anywhere because it's basically coming as a CRA um, rebate. So it's something that happens kind of at the patient level and you can pick which dentist you go to. So maybe in the next couple of years, we may see that patients have a bit of access to a bit, of, you know, a bit more dentistry through this program. Um, so that was the only other thing I was gonna touch upon. I would invite you to ask me any questions if you have any. Sure. Dr. Watson, you've got a great team there. Yes. So the question is basically if you're, you know, if you're a patient diagnosed with myeloma and you want to get access to dental services and hopefully see a dentist who has a similar level of, of knowledge as we do at Princess Margaret, where could you go? Um, that is a very tricky question. So one of the reasons we have so much knowledge at Princess Margaret is because we just see so many patients with myeloma and we're in the major transplant center. Um, so there are not, unfortunately, a lot of places that you can go. And at Princess Margaret, we see we're up to about 30 to 40 new patients every single week now, not just with myeloma. There's also other patient groups that we see, but we see huge numbers of patients. So because of that, as many of you know, some of you sitting in the audience here, um, when you've recovered enough from your treatment, we, we almost force you to go back to your dentist in the community because we need to keep spots open for all these new patients who are coming in. Um, we do have fellows that graduate from the program every year who are working in private practice. And if you go onto our website, you can find the names of the fellows who have graduated from our program, and those would be fantastic uh, dentists to go see in private practice. There are also some hospitals that do accept patients who um, were not treated at their center. So Sunnybrook has a dental clinic um, that I believe accepts patients from just the general population. Um, our sister hospital, Toronto Rehab Institute, which is two doors down from Princess Margaret, also accepts patients from the general population. Um, and they often treat patients with uh, Alzheimer's or other mobility deficits. So they're very good at working with patients who are in wheelchairs. Um, so that's a really good place to go. I'm pretty sure that uh, Baycrest uh, has a dental service that is also accepting patients from the community. So those would all be good places to try. But I am hopeful that with this increase, um, I, I only started teaching my course at the Faculty of Dentistry two years ago. So I am very hopeful that over the years, we're gonna start seeing more and more dentists in the community who have a little bit of an understanding how to treat patients with myeloma. So the question was about hyperbaric oxygen treatment and osteonecrosis of the jaw. Um, so hyperbaric oxygen is basically like a chamber, a high pressure chamber that you can go into where more oxygen is given to, um, is given to a patient in the hopes that it's going to promote healing. It's most typically done in patients who have um, death of jawbone because of head and neck radiation where they really feel like the area doesn't have enough blood vessels to heal itself. 
Many, many studies have been done on this over the years, and it's unfortunately just shown that it's not effective. Um, and very rarely in some patients it seems to make a difference, but it seems to really be on an individual level. And it's, um, it's not, you know, it's not, an, it's not nothing to go through. It's usually patients have to go for say 30 treatments. So you're back to going to the hospital every day for several hours of treatment. And if it's not really that effective, why, why put patients through it? Um, there's also, I'm not, I don't know, I think of any cases of MRON, so specifically those caused by medication that we've tried to uh, treat with hyperbaric oxygen at our center but I imagine there would probably be some kind of contraindication because patients have active disease um, and you worry about putting a lot of oxygen into that type of environment. There is, however, um, a group of medications that collectively are called the Pentaclo regimen, which are also given to patients with necrosis because of radiation. And it's basically a combination of a medication that helps to make blood vessels regrow and a steroid to help calm down inflammation, and also, strangely enough, a bisphosphonate, but one of the pill forms, and one that specifically turns on the bone-making cell and doesn't impact the bone-eating cell. And that's shown a little bit of promise in radiation and may also show promise in MRONG, but we don't have the studies that support it yet. It is very difficult when a patient develops MRONG to have access to hospital-based treatment because most Places that treat myeloma don't have dental clinics, and it's usually oral surgeons who treat this type of complication. So when it's, um, and, and most, you know, some oral surgeons have hospital-based practices, but many of them are in the community too. So it's very difficult. Once a patient develops MRONG, we don't really have good accepted treatment for it, and it's difficult to find access to oral surgeons in hospitals who are able to treat it. Dr. Weiss, yes. we have some questions from the Zoomers. Perfect, we have some Zoom questions. We have some Zoom questions. Uh, the first one is, you talked about um, asking myeloma patients for x-rays that were slightly more robust than the basic x-rays. Um, if you could please identify what those full x-rays are called, that would be really helpful. Sure, so the question was about how I kept talking about the different types of x-rays and how you need to ask for different types of x-rays. Um, so the type of x-ray that you commonly get when you go into your dentist for a checkup is called a bite wing. That's what we call them, they're called bite wing x-rays. Bite wing x-rays aren't enough to diagnose infection. You either need a panoramic which is one, the one I showed you that shows the entire jaw, the like really, really big one of the whole jaw structures. That would be my first choice, a panoramic x-ray. Not all dental offices have panoramic x-ray units. So if they don't have panoramic x-ray units, they can take something called intraoral x-rays, which are just close-ups of each tooth where they actually look at the tip of the root. And that's where they need to be looking is at the, at the tip of the root to check for infections there. I'll take one more. Um, the other question really has to do with the common outcomes of MRONG, and I think you've covered that. The specific question is, um, there is an individual who's having surgery on, on her tooth uh, one week after a scheduled DERA infusion. And our question is really, should she stop DERA? Um, she means DERA tumuma? Correct, okay. So the question is a patient's being planned for surgery and they're on daratumumab and is um, and they're basically asking if they need to cancel the appointment. So daratumumab is not a medication that's implicated in this poor healing after dental surgeries. So as long as um, I assume that whoever's on daratumumab has probably been on it for a while and knows how it impacts their blood work. You know, if you saw that after receiving a dose, all of a sudden your platelet count normally drops, you know, to something really low, or your neutrophil count drops to really something very low, then you might want to reschedule the appointment. But as long as that's not the case, there's no reason to cancel. Um, I saw a question in the chat actually just pop up. Someone was asking if I could say again what treatments aren't safe in patients who are on intravenous Zomata. Um, so I would focus more on what isn't safe because really most dentistry is safe. Cleanings are safe, fillings are safe, root canals are safe, crowns are safe, all that type of stuff is safe, dentures are safe. 
What isn't safe is anything that involves manipulating bone. So pulling out teeth, because that's pulling a tooth out of the bone. Placing a dental implant, because that's putting an implant into the bone. Um, surgeries, like surgical cleanings, or surgeries where they change the bone level around teeth, where they're lifting gums off of the bone and removing bone. Um, there is rarely a type of surgical root canal treatment that's performed. That's where you know, your dentist did the root canal and it's still infected, so sometimes they'll actually lift up a piece of gum, tunnel in through the bone, and cut off the tip of the root. You wouldn't be able to do that because that's a surgery involving bone. Um, and, and actually one thing I didn't mention is braces. So the way that we move teeth as dentists, when you put force on a tooth, it's actually telling the bone eating cell to eat up the bone on the one side of the tooth and that's what allows the tooth to move. So if you're on Zomeda, um, your braces won't work. And then the doctor will start putting more and more force to try and get the teeth to work. And we actually have seen some case reports of patients who've ended up with bone exposure from having braces. So I, I wouldn't recommend braces if anyone was thinking of getting Invisalign at this stage in life. <laughs> yes? Um, this might be something I should ask my oncologist, but I, I, I was taking a major like a long time. I haven't had it for 12 years probably after taking it. And you mentioned it's less effective than the newer I mean, do I need to ask my oncologist So the question was um, from a patient who's been on permidronate, they were on it for many years and has been off of it for about 12 years, and whether or not they should be speaking to their oncologist about potentially being placed on something like Zomeda because it's stronger. Um, the decision would really be based, usually the decision is based off of a bone survey. So typically um, your doctor will do surveys of your bones and look for what they call lytic lesions, which is really a fancy way of saying holes in the bones. And if they don't see those, there's no reason to be placed on the drug. The other times they sometimes put patients on the drug as if their calcium levels are really high, because if bones being eaten up a lot by plasma cells, um, there's a lot of calcium in bones, so calcium levels start going up, and that would be a reason to go back on it. Yeah. Yeah. You might need fluoride. The comment was that his teeth seem to be falling apart. Anytime someone tells me that their teeth seem to be falling apart, I, I think about dry mouth and I think about fluoride. Okay. Yeah. Yes. We, we had a Um, so someone had to discontinue Zomeda because of, of the damage to the kidneys and that's something that we commonly see is patients on bisphosphonates um, can't necessarily be on Zomeda. Um, uh, a lot of times patients going through transplant will have the Zomeda held for a while because the transplant's really tough on the kidneys too. Um, and whether or not denosumab every six months is as effective. I think to be equally as effective as Zomeda, it's typically given on a monthly basis but I would suggest asking your oncologist that question. It's really, the decision is really based off of how your bone health is doing um, and balancing damage to kidneys. So it isn't, as far as I understand, every six months is not as effective as every month. I think the issue is funding approvals That's correct. So denosumab, Zomeda, I think is like, four dollars for an infusion or something like that denosumab is eight hundred dollars so the government hasn't approved it as um as a first line treatment um so it, that may be part of the rationale is just having access to, to some of these medications unfortunately a lot of the drugs for myeloma are really expensive like denosumab is nothing compared to revlimid yes So the question was, does the uh, dental clinic at Princess Margaret do root canal treatments? Um, so we do have one dentist who does root canal treatments on a regular basis. I don't do root canals very often, and in my patients who are on these bone strengthening drugs where we can't pull out their teeth, um, I don't want to be the person doing the root canal because I don't think that I'm the very best person to be doing it. So we have a root canal specialist that we work with. He's not in our clinic. He has a microscope and his microscope's really expensive and we don't want to have to buy one. So we send our patients to him. He's at Bay and Bloor. 
Um, but we do have one specific uh, root canal specialist group that we work with. And I've been to that doctor at Bainbridge. You've been to the Bainbridge doctor? They're very good. They're very nice. Here's a question from mm -hmm. a Zoomer. Uh, I've been on Zometa for six years with breaks for dental work. I spontaneously developed ulcer exposing bone. Dental surgeon can't confirm diagnosis of hemorrhage. How is it diagnosed? So the question is uh, about a patient who's been on Zometa for uh, on and off for a few years and they develop spontaneous bone exposure and I guess their surgeon is having difficulty or they developed an ulcer and a bit of bone exposure and their dentist is having difficulty deciding whether or not it's emronge. The decision to call someone something emronge or to diagnose someone with emronge is really based off of a clinical exam. So if I saw someone with bone exposure that I couldn't otherwise explain, like I didn't think that they had a, a cancer growing in their mouth and they'd been on this medication, that would be enough for me to, to diagnose the condition. Yes? Um, I, I've seen some uh, new technology, um, it's the Cone Beam CT, um, which uh, gives a lot of detail um, uh, on the, the teeth that are um, uh, scanned. Um, and it's also a, a, a second opinion with the radiologist. Um, when, when would you uh, recommend that kind of um, uh, scan for, uh, for teeth or gums? So the question was about new technology called the comb beam CT scan and how it gives a lot of information about teeth and when we, we recommend a scan like that. So a cone beam CT scan is basically like a really tiny little CT scan that focuses on one part of the jaw and we really only order it for very specific reasons. So for example, if I saw a patient who had had a root canal treatment done on the tooth and it looked like the root canal treatment was failing and we wanted to ask ourselves, is it failing because there's a canal that was missed or is it failing because the tooth is fractured? we could take a cone beam CT scan and be able to know that for sure. Um, but you don't take it just willy-nilly to see what's going on in the jaws. It's really if you have a very specific question that can only be answered by this little localized CT scan. Yes? So the question is whether or not a patient who's on Zometa should be concerned if their dentist tells them that they have inflammation. When your dentist tells you that you have inflammation, what they're really saying is that your gums don't look perfectly healthy. Um, and the best way, and that is something to be concerned about, because if your gums aren't healthy, you're at risk for losing bone around the teeth. The best way to deal with that would be to get a water flosser. If my dentist was telling me that I had a water flosser or a water pick. Yeah, it's just like a, it's almost, it's just like a little water gun that shoots between your teeth. It does a magnificent job. That would be, if your dentist tells you have inflammation, go home, get yourself a water flosser. Makes a gigantic mess. Huge mess. <laughs> yes. Should I be getting a second opinion? I've seen a dental surgeon, I'm not entirely sure. Frankly, I don't think he's worked on my location before. Mm -hmm. And the last time, I've been taking so many off and on for four years, the last time I took it was in June. Then I was supposed to go last week and he said I not to. I've had the x ray from uh, Canaray, and at this point I'm waiting for the results, but I have it looks like a, either a broken root sticking out of my gum or an extra tooth or whatever. Listen, my general dentist and surgeon were at a loss of what to do for someone petrified or somebody who's had this much so big. Should I go to your hospital or one of the other hospitals? Get a second opinion of what to do? So if um, the question is basically about a patient who's experiencing some side effects in their mouth and their dentist doesn't seem to know and their, uh, the surgeon doesn't seem to know what to do about it and whether or not they, you know it's bone or a tooth root or something like that. It does sound like you probably need a second opinion. Um, there are some really, really good oral surgery practices in the community with guys that know what they're doing. Um, I'm not supposed to specifically recommend places, but some of like the big groups where they're in multiple locations and you see that those doctors also have appointments at hospitals, those are usually really good sites to go to. Um, Princess Margaret, we will only see a patient who received care at Princess Margaret. So if you receive 
taking care of Princess Margaret, you could ask your doctor to refer to us. Outside of that, I would probably suggest being referred to the surgery group at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai Hospital, which is right next to Princess Margaret, has a large oral surgery department. Those guys know how to treat emeronge and they would know what to do. If you had a stem cell transplant done in Princess Margaret, that's fine. You can get your dentist or, um, or your doctor to refer to us. Oh, so I can just phone up myself and say... To call your dentist or doctor and just say, can you send a referral to Princess Margaret Dentistry for me? And then we can see you. That's fine. Yeah. Is the water pick the same as the water flosser? The, the, sorry, the question was, is a water pick the same as a water flosser? Yes, same thing. Any other questions? Yes. Hmm. I, I asked myself, uh, so she did some basic x-ray, but you mentioned like it would be anorex that they should uh, ask for and how often and would she be, let's say, um, knowledgeable to you know, comment on, on what she's seeing? So the question was about a patient who's been seeing their dentist for some time and they seem maybe a little bit reluctant to take x-rays and they've also been on uh, Zometa for some years. So um, the first thing that I would say is that when it's really important to detect all those infections is before you start on the medication because that's when we actually have an opportunity for prevention. Um, that being said, we normally recommend taking a panoramic every five years because that's when we expect to see significant changes. So if you haven't had that in five years, it would be a good idea to get, ask for one. And yes, most, all, all dentists should be able to, the second question was, would my dentist even know what to do if they took one? All dentists should be able to review a panoramic x-ray and say what they see on it. So uh, if I was followed <coughs> before I, I was started, started treatment in Princess Margaret, and I was told that there is So the question was, um, I guess this, uh, this patient has been seen previously at Princess Margaret prior to transplant, we would have taken a panoramic 100% and the question is should it be taken at the same place for comparison. It doesn't need to be taken at the same place but you can write to our front desk and we can send you the x-ray that was taken so that they can compare it. That's an easy thing to do. Very good question. So the question was, if you're someone who doesn't have dental insurance and you're brushing your teeth every day um, and you're using a toothpaste with fluoride in it, which everyone should use a toothpaste with some level of fluoride in it, um, and floss, very good. Um, and then, uh, well, I just distracted myself. Oh, right, do you need to still go for that? Do you still need to get that fluoride treatment that your dentist recommends? To be honest, um, that fluoride treatment is probably a little bit more important for younger p patients, particularly children. If you're not getting a lot of cavities, it's probably not necessary. Uh, question from a Zoomer. Sure. Um, uh, for individuals, and this particular uh, individual is from Windsor, mm -hmm. um, where can she get information about dental clinics that treat cancer patients in Windsor? Windsor. So the question is, what do you do if you're in Windsor? You write to your local MP and complain about the fact that Windsor is a massive city that doesn't have a dental oncology clinic. Same thing in London. Um, no, London has, but uh, Hamilton doesn't and Kingston doesn't either. That's one of the things that we're working on in our provincial working group. Yes. Yes. Are there any biomedical treatments that tend to increase the rate of young recession? And a second question, is, is there anything other than good hygiene and maybe the water bank that we could use to reduce the alcohol recession? So the question was, um, first, are there any myeloma treatments that are known to cause gum recession? Not to my knowledge, no. 
Um, and then the second question was, is there anything other than regular, like brushing your teeth and using a water flosser? I'm seeing we, we learned something today, that's fantastic. Um, can reduce the, your risk of having gum disease. And regular cleanings would be the other thing. Regular cleanings at the dentist will help reduce your risk of having gum disease. Yes? Water floss or water pick, same thing? Same thing. Water flosser, water pick, same thing. Are there very many and one better than the other? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. No, I don't know one to be better than the other. Anything that you can use to shoot water between your teeth and get, get the meat out is what's going to work. Can you just buy these at your local? Yeah, you can buy them at any local pharmacy. Shoppers has them. Costco has them. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Uh, so uh, can we take one, one last question if there are any? Uh, yes? So, like, if two uh, percent is like a good canal, this is not some of this. If you needed to, if you've been a patient, at, if you've been a patient at PMH, you can consult with us. Unfortunately, we only um, do consultations for patients who've been treated at PMH. But yes, if you're a dentist, we always tell our patients when we send them back to their dentist in the community, if your dentist sees you and says you need your tooth pulled out, come back and talk to us about it instead. And we'll probably recommend, you know, a bad filling or something weird uh, to avoid pulling out the tooth. Okay. Yeah, yes? So the question was, if she saw a root canal specialist and they weren't really sure what to do, could they ask us for advice? Yes, I I'd probably provide advice to like two dentists a day. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, Dr. Watson, uh, Bob is going to uh, formally thank you, but uh, just a, a couple of comments. Thank you for all that uh, tremendous amount of insulation. <laughs> thank you so much for advocating for treatments for us. We, we, we most, most humbly uh, appreciate that. And uh, if there's one takeaway for me, I mean, there are a lot of them, but in particular, get a water pick. <laughs> so. Yeah. And don't forget to floss. <laughs> Dr. Watson, thank you so much. Uh, this was a learning curve today, and I'm told that we probably, between Zoom and in-house, we have about 40 participants. So thank you for spending some of your day off with us, uh, all the work you did to present, uh, prepare your slides. And as Dave said, thank you so much for what you do for myeloma patients on a daily basis at your clinic. And with that in mind, we'd like to thank you with a so little Canadiana gift. Really nice yeah, and thank you. I five years ago, and you guys gave me a beautiful ceramic for all that. Well, that's good. And as there's also in there is a, a, C, a DVD of your past presentation here. And uh, you can show that to your kids and tell them what the heck a DVD is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So thank you so much again. Yeah. And, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay.